Hey coders and welcome back to another video. Today we're doing a pretty cool, nice deep dive at one month review for the Asus ROG Ally, uh, a device which I picked up on my own uh, and wanted to kind of give you my thoughts on how it's been, uh, what some of the positives, uh, the negatives and everything in between have been since owning this device. So far, um, high level, I gotta say I've really loved it, but we're gonna dive in and get into all the nitty gritties, including performance, we'll get into usability, we'll get into the overall experience. So strap in and uh, let's, get it, let's get into this video. First up, I wanted to tackle the getting started process and how simple or not simple that was. Uh, so when I first got the device um, right on launch day, actually I think a day before launch day, uh, I was greeted by a pretty simple process. If you're familiar with Windows devices or how to set up Windows on a laptop, it's gonna be very large, very much largely the same. Uh, the difference being that the Asus ROG Ally also comes with a number of driver updates as well as software updates that you really want to get onto the device uh, as quick as possible. Um, there were some debates online in the Reddit uh, forums whether or not there were issues with certain drivers and certain firmware updates. I never had any experiences that were super negative there. Uh, in fact, when I uh, got my device, it was on 3.19 um, and it was... Perfect. There was no issues. There was no performance de degradation. I didn't have to do any of the tricks. I tried them all. None of them really resulted in anything. So overall, it was actually a pretty smooth process, but I would say go ahead and craft out about an hour of your time uh, to get this device all set up and downloading your first few games. Um, but there was one big call out that I wanted to make, and that was the Xbox, uh, the Xbox Game Pass PC store. And the reason for that one is there were some challenges for me when getting that one set up. The biggest issue was that it would not install games and I couldn't figure out exactly why it wouldn't install games or even worse, it would install them, but it actually wouldn't play them. And what I found out, and uh, this is an old trick that I learned from the laptop that I've had that was also a Windows device, uh, is that the time zone was not being automatically updated and synced uh, together. So that was causing issues with launching games. I wasn't able to play Sunset Overdrive on Steam or Stream uh, when I first used the device things like that. I eventually updated that. Since then, Xbox Game Pass uh, PC Store has been pretty much perfect, um, so that's been good. Uh, so that was the first little bit of impressions on how to get that set up. Let's dive in now into overall performance. So with performance, I have to say I'm overall, overall very pleasantly surprised. Now, this is not a high-end laptop by any means. However, it does have a high-end CPU. And so, because of that, it allows a wider gap of games that you can play at really high frame rates, especially with decent uh, graphical settings. Um, when buying a laptop, one of my biggest pieces of advice would be to get one with the best CPU you can get and prioritize the GPU slightly behind that because pretty much all mobile GPUs are good. Um, however, they're not gonna be as good as the desktop counterparts. Uh, on the CPU side, there it's an even bigger gulf. The difference between a mobile CPU and a desktop CPU is generally quite large. And if you skimp out on the CPU, then you're gonna be finding that about a year or two in, you're gonna find a lot of CPU limited games and it's gonna be very difficult uh, to compete with those bigger desktop rigs. Uh, same thing goes for this device. Uh, there's nothing specifically wrong with the makeup of the hardware. In fact, I would say it's spectacular for what it's trying to accomplish. At 1080p, many, many games are gonna run at 40 to 60 FPS. But that's not where the magic lies in this device. The magic lies in this display. Oh, I almost launched Far Cry. Uh, <laughs> the magic lies in this display. And what I mean by that is that this is 120 hertz VRR display. I wanna go ahead and just take a step back and talk a little bit about people who have referred to the 120 hertz display as a battery killer, things like that. VRR is a battery killer. That is not true in my testing. I have tried a number of different games and a number of different formats at a number of different frame rates. And I can tell you that the difference between the VRR 120 hertz display using that 120 hertz mode and not uh, is about a half a watt. So 
battery life is not going to be drastically different even if you turn off VRR. And frankly, it looks dramatically better with VR display. That's going to give you a very good experience for games that are dropping down to about 40 FPS and all the way up to 60 FPS. VRR window is 48 to 60, but I can parse 48 to 120, but uh, it does have low frame rate compensation and there's some tricks you can do to make that even better. So the screen is the magic here. It's better than almost every other device on the market. In fact, I'm pretty sure there are no other VRR display uh, options on the market, which is insane because that should be a, an absolute sand standard. The closest thing that we have is the Steam Deck, which can manually set a frame rate, or I'm sorry, a refresh rate. So if you wanna lock something to 40 FPS, you can get a really nice pleasing image rather than trying to make 40 FPS fit into a 60 Hertz package, which doesn't look very good. Um, that's enough about the technical side of things, but I can just assure you that from like the hardware perspective, you're going to be playing 40 to 60 FPS. I can say that Uncharted was running between, uh, 45 to 60 FPS on a regular basis with everything set to medium and, um, the certain things set to high. So with all of that, I only had to run it at FSR performance using AMD RIS. It looked like a 1080p image. It had almost no pixel breakup. It had incredible visuals. It was one of the best experiences of the game that I've ever had just because I got to play it on my couch and it was amazing. Same thing goes with Spider-Man. You can play 45 to 60 FPS there. Uh, you can go play Warframe at 120 uh, FPS. I'll show some footage in the background of those games running at those frame rates and check the channel for uh, guides on how to get these games running uh, as best as you can. I did Sims 3, Sims 4, I did Warframe, I did uh, The Division, which runs extremely good at 60 FPS on this device. Um, all of these are turbo profiles because I tend to play like that, and I do play plugged in a lot, I will admit that. That being said, the handheld performance is still quite great, and if you are willing to do a little bit of tinkering, you can get some extremely good performance there as well. Um, we're not going to get too much into the customizations that I'd recommend you guys do, but I will say that the Reddit forums have been a great, uh, format for you guys to kind of pick the brains of lots of people who have good tech knowledge, uh, to find out what might work well. So, um, we'll continue to monitor that. And this is all without official AMD, uh, drivers. So I only expect performance to improve from here, uh, which is obviously a fantastic sign. So. That's it for performance. Let's move on to the overall comfort of using the device. So right here, we're gonna see that you have a nice, two nice uh, thumbsticks that are very, very pleasing to use. They are a little light on the resistance. That's something you wanna keep in mind when you're using this, is it's not gonna feel like an Xbox controller. For example, I have an Xbox controller right here, and these thumbsticks resist a lot more. They feel a little bit more pleasing to use, but uh, I will say that there's a little bit of fatigue after a bit of a long play session. The other thing is that this feels quite small in my hands now after playing with the Asus ROG Ally. I don't know if that's just the, the design of it, but I will say like fingers rest in really good pleasing spots. These buttons are easily accessible. I don't use them a ton except for macros um, on the desktop. And then the A, B, X, Y buttons, I've had zero sticking. So all of those pre-release pre reports, I think were on old versions of the hardware. Uh, I haven't seen much either in the Reddit uh, forums, so I'm going to say that the, thump, the the buttons are actually quite good, and I love these little buttons in the middle. They're very responsive and very good. Uh, the triggers are amazing. They're analog, but they're hall-based, so they're going to not you know have any sort of error issues. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you set those dead zones into a comfortable place for your device because every device is going to be slightly different. And then these buttons are just pleasing. I'm messing with the screen now. Um, the only thing that I have complaints about, and I'm not a big D-pad guy, but I have to say, this D-pad feels like shit. <laughs> this is not a good D-pad. Um, I think that the D-pad on the Xbox controller is kind of where I like it. I like it a little clickier, a lot, lot more responsive, but uh, the, I have so many false positives on diagonals and, and not registering up or left or right and things like that in games like uh, when I'm emulating. So I'd say for an emulation device, if you're going really old school, this is not really the device that you're going to want. Um, that would probably be my biggest complaint about the actual physical dimensions and hardware. As for the weight, it's fantastic. As for the fans, they keep it very cool. I very rarely feel any sort of warmth around where my hands are. It obviously gets quite, quite high to, hot up here, but that's expelling the hot air. And my temperatures overall have been quite good as a result of that. Um, the We'll get into the SD card stuff in a little bit. I've done 
a little bit of diagnosing of my own situation, which is not as bad as any of the people on the forums, uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about it and what I might, what I think might be happening in a lot of these situations. So that's it for the hardware and the feel, but overall really impressed of how this device feels. And I hope you guys, uh, get a chance to get this in your hands before you purchase it to kind of see what that all feels like, because I think it's quite a nice, comfortable device. Um, so this next part, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges, the, the downsides that I've had using it. Um, one of the bigger downsides is just what I expected coming into it, which is that Windows can be a fiddly uh, platform. Uh, Windows 11 is much better than previous Windows platforms. Like when you go back to Windows 8 and Windows, you know, before that, like, Seven was pretty stable. Uh, Windows eight was awful. And then Windows 10 was great. Windows 11 has been an extension of Windows 10 to me. A little bit better, good for touch screens. The touching, touch screen is good. Everything like that is awesome. It's just overall, you're gonna have to play with this device to get it into an, a super, super ideal situation. Now, will it play games good out, out of the box as long as you install those firmware updates and those updates for to Windows? Yes, it will. It's as long as you are a very simple gamer, you're not gonna really run into issues. I haven't had a game not run well on this device. Honestly, not one. I've tried dozens, dozens of games, uh, playing through Persona 5, all of it just, just flawlessly. And most of them I can set to pretty high settings and experience without too bad of frame rates. So actually really good frame rates. So overall, it's just fiddly. And I think that that is one of those things, but I really like to mess with settings. So because I like to mess with settings and because I'm fairly familiar with how Windows works and its downsides, I've been mostly issue free. That being said, the big one that's been hanging over everybody's head throughout this process is the SD card issue. And I have to say that is a real issue that is currently occurring. Nobody should be denying that that is occurring. That being said, I have not had an SD card die on me. I have had weird, inconsistent performance with SD cards. And we'll talk about a little bit about that uh, right now. I'm going to try to, let me go ahead and get this SD card out. I'm going to showcase an SD card that I've had a lot of trouble with. And then I'm going to showcase an SD card that I've had basically no issues with. Um, and I think there's base, there's one simple reason why, uh, I decided I wanted a terabyte and I didn't want to pay a lot of money for it because it was a new device and I'd already sunk $700 into it. So I wanted to keep it nice and cheap. So I went and got a silicone power and hopefully this will, there we go. A silicone power, one terabyte, oh, I'm upside down. One terabyte, uh, micro SD card. You can already see that it's, it's a little beaten up. Like it's got chips and like in the paint, it doesn't look particularly great. It is a terabyte. <laughs> I didn't get a false uh, SD card. Uh, it's rated at 100 megs down and I believe, or 100, 100 megs read, and I think 30 to 50 write. In my experience, I got 30 to 50 read write, or write for the first maybe 10 days. When I was installing everything, it was working just fine. The first 10 days of usage spin, it was just, it was fantastic. I got a terabyte of games on there. I played a ton of them off of there. Sunset Overdrive, I got, you know, 20 or 10 hours into and no issues there. Tons of games I played off this SD card. Uh, and then I started uninstalling and trying to install more things as it got more and more full. And I just noticed that the write speed became extremely inconsistent. I'm going to put on some on screen uh, just some of the, exp the, the experience that I had. Like, for example, the Silicon Power uh, SD card runs full bore at 100% capacity anytime you're doing any sort of writing to it. So if you're writing to the to the card, it's gonna run at 100% full bore and it's gonna cause a ton of heat. <laughs> I don't know why, but this is not like the experience that I've had with any of my other SD cards. So the other SD cards that I've had that have been extremely good, and I'm gonna try to showcase this one pretty clearly is this Samsung Evo 256 gigabyte and a 512 version too. I have two of these and these have been fantastic. This was extremely cheap. So I've been running all my emulation off of this one. And on my other one, I've just been using as an expansion for my Xbox uh, uh, Game Pass games and Steam games. So that has been uh, fantastic, no issues. But the way that that one writes is that it's not constantly at 100%. 
it goes through these spikes of write speed. So it will go all the way up to 90 megabits per second, which is what it's rated for. And then it will dip down to like 20, 30, and then it will go back up. It does this like spike kind of build of it. When you're downloading games, it will just display as that 30 megabits per second or whatever I'm downloading at. Um, but it's not constantly at 100%. And because of that, I've not noticed them overheating at all. I have no idea why that is. I have to say I am very skeptical that the SD card uh, is being caused by overheating, at least exclusively. There may be examples of people who have bad hardware that have been failing, and those have be, should be RMA'd and returned back and everything like that and getting fixed. My experience has not been that. This has not died. I have had to defrag it. I've had to try to repair it. I've had to do things like that. I've had to just pull it at times because it's frozen my system. Uh, but I think it's all related to the fact that this one runs incorrectly i think it's the sd card that is that is having problems this thing is not rated for what i'm trying to put it through uh, even though they claim it is so i'm going to say stay away from the silicone power one terabyte ones you may get have luck i want to say that sd cards are extremely inconsistent in terms of their manufacturing but instead go over to the samsung one because my experience has been dramatically better with the samsung evo pro uh, and go for the V2 card because you're just going to get our A2 card because you're going to get a little bit better speeds and a little bit more consistency uh, with random read, reads and writes. Um, that's what I recommend. You can't get it in a terabyte, which is a bummer, but I do think that there might be there may be some credence to those terabyte cards having problems. And so I'm going to continue to do that. And I will say I tested it on this Anchor SD card reader with the silicone power one as well, and it had the same issues that uh, it had inside my asus rug ally it's still read at 100 or, or wrote at 100 percent and caused lots of heat i just pulled it out and it was actually quite warm and i hadn't even been doing anything on it there was nothing being installed to it i tried to copy over a video file and it took like 12 minutes uh because the at one point it read at 90 or i'm sorry wrote to it at 90 megabits per second then suddenly stopped uh completely about you know, three seconds in and then waited for another minute and a half. And then eventually after a minute and a half, it started writing at six megabits per second. And that's where it settles at is about five to six megabits per second and won't go over it. So that's my experience. Whereas the uh, Samsung Evo Pro has been writing it very consistently at 30 megabits per second and above uh, with no issues, no heating issues. So that's my two cents on the SD card reader situation. I don't think that it's the same for everybody. And I do think that there will be improvements in software. I think it has to be related to that UHS-2 reader. Um, they have a lot more pins. They have different driver uh, needs. They have different power needs. And I think that there was a mistake by Asus in how they tuned the power regulation on those things. So... I'm hoping that they'll fix this. I'm hoping they're going to find that it's more than just overheating issues. Um, but that's been my only negative that I've had so far. I basically had to just retire the silicone power card because it's not a good card, not because the device is destroying it. Not having any issues with the Samsung Evos. I've been running them for uh, days now. No issues consistently. Been able to download at full speed, play at full speed. Downloads or loading speeds are not bad at all. So that's my thoughts overall. Um... Now I guess we'll get to my final thoughts on the device. Should you pick up an Asus ROG Ally and what will that experience be like for you? Personally, I think that you're gonna have a great time with an Asus ROG Ally. I think if you're a tinkerer, it's the device for you. You should absolutely get it, uh, especially if you want a handheld uh, version of your PC. Do I think it can replace desktop? Yes, in certain situations, I think it can replace desktop, especially if you're interested in the attachable external GPUs. They're very expensive, so this is not the inexpensive way to go. This is not the way that I'm going to go, but I think you could do it because the CPU is so good, especially plugged in, and because those GPUs that they offer are quite, you know, good, um, you could definitely get away with it being your desktop setup. You could be a video editor off of it. You could do all of these things. Uh, the biggest thing you're going to run into is, is port availability and just overall storage space and how you're going to manage that because... Putting in a new micro SD card is hard. 2230s are very expensive. So those are something that you're going to want to think about if you're going to do it as your main desktop. If you're not, then you're going to have a great time with this device and you're just going to try to play games. It's going to play games better than pretty much anything on the market. There are other handheld companies out there that are competing in the 7840U market, which is the 
processor, uh, the APU combo that we have in there. And I think that Asus being a much bigger company, you have a little bit more comfort knowing that you're going to get supported for a lot longer by buying from them. That being said, we don't know for sure. So it's something you're going to want to keep your eyes on as we move forward through this journey. Uh, but a month in, I stand on very strongly recommend if you're considering a handheld PC, uh, this is probably the one to get for $699. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this review and you found it really insightful. Uh, go ahead and like the video if you like what we do. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. Um, we'll probably continue to make some Asus ROG Ally content, but we'll also be doing a ton of live streams, a ton of videos, and just overall, hopefully, bring you a lot of entertaining stuff uh, in the year 2023 and beyond. So, stick it here. Thanks again. And as always, stay classy, coders.